And joining us now, Conservative MP for Oakville, Terence Young, author of Death by Prescription, A Father Takes on His Daughter's Killer. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you for inviting me, Steve. Your family doctor, we're going to tell the story here, your family doctor had prescribed something called Propulsid for your daughter, Vanessa. How come? Um, she had a problem throwing up after meals, like about one out of four teenage girls does, and uh, that was recommended that that might help her stop throwing up after meals. Did you know anything about this drug before you had... No, no. Uh, we had absolutely no warning that the drug had caused any harm to, to patients previously. We had no warning that, that there was any risk associated with the drug. We viewed it as a sort of uh, super rolades. Super rolades? Yeah, helped her stomach, you know. Gotcha. March 19, 2000. You're never going to forget that date again, I know. You're at home with Vanessa. Well, March, she... March 18, 2000, we were out shopping right. on a Saturday. Vanessa stayed home to bake cookies, and uh, we came in about 6 o'clock. Gloria went to start dinner, and Vanessa came to negotiate her over her Saturday night's activities, like 15-year-old daughters do. And so uh, we chatted a bit, and she jumped up to go upstairs and fell back down on the carpet. Her heart stopped dead. So what did she actually die of? Uh, she died of a heart arrhythmia which was caused, uh, and the coroner's jury agreed that it was caused by the drug Propulsid in conjunction with a mild form of bulimia that she had. And she passed away the next day? She died the next day. She never regained consciousness. Im virtually immediately after this took place, there were questions about Propulsid, the drug that she was on. What kinds of things were you hearing, either from your family doctor or after you started doing research? What well, kinds of things? Immediately, the, the emergency crews came to the house and they said, is she taking any drugs? We said, no, the only thing she's taking is Propulsid. And they looked at the pills and they looked through her handbag and, of course, there was nothing else. And then they got her in an ambulance to the hospital. They managed to restart her heart. And the doctors kept saying, you know, uh, when does she start taking Propulsid, et cetera? And they're looking in this big, thick blue book, which I later found out is called the Compendium of Pharmaceuticals and Specialties. And they were leaning over it, reading the fine print. I later found out this was the fine print that none of them had read before because it said right in the CPS that Propulsive was contraindicated for anyone that was throwing up. Contraindicated meaning? Contraindicated is the most important term in drug safety, Steve. Everyone should know what it means. It means against the indications. It means uh, against what the drug was approved for. It means the risk will never outweigh the benefits. So you never ever take a contraindicated drug with another drug that it's contraindicated with or food or or sometimes even grapefruit juice is contraindicated with a number of drugs. Or if you're suffering from this, be sure you or, don't take or this. Or a condition, that's correct. Right. Yeah. Let's just, because Propulsive may be a drug a lot of people have not heard of, so just if we could, we're going to bring up some information here. It is one of those what they call blockbuster drugs. A yes. billion dollars in sales a year. It's sold in 119 countries worldwide. There have been 341 adverse reactions reported, this is according to your book, including 80 deaths from people taking Propulsive. Now, did your family doctor who prescribed this know anything about this before prescribing it? Um, I don't know for sure if he knew there had been 80 deaths, but I doubt it. But certainly he knew very little about the risks of Propulsid. Now, Propulsid had gone on the market in 1990, and even in, in pre-market testing before the drug was approved, uh, eight infants that were taking the drug had died during the testing period. So you think that would have been a warning signal to the drug company, uh, Johnson & Johnson. But over the years after it was approved, they discovered that patients were having heart arrhythmias and some of them were dying and there was a body count that was happening. So instead of taking the drug off the market or, or issuing really effective warnings so the doctors knew the true risks, they just changed the label on the drug. Now, the label is not on the little bottle of pills that you get. The label is a document few patients ever see and most doctors never look at. It's 30 to 50 pages of small print and it's in that big thick book, the CPS, that's in the pharmacies and the doctor's offices. And if you look through the fine print on most drugs, you'll find the true risks of taking that drug. So the trouble it, is no one ever sees it. Was it reasonable for your doctor to have known about that? Well, um, over the 10 years Propulsive had been on the market, they had issued five label changes. Once they, the first one, they said, well, don't take Propulsive with erythromycin. Apparently, it causes uh, a heart arrhythmia with erythromycin. And then they said, well, don't take it with this drug and that drug. Uh, and, and they changed the label five times over 10 years. And yet the sales kept going up and up and up to a billion dollars. So obviously the doctors weren't heeding the warnings or weren't getting the warnings, and they knew that by 1998. Okay. One of the things you said about being contraindicated, you weren't supposed to take it if you were throwing up. Correct. But your daughter was throwing up and she was taking it. 
And that information was apparently on the website, right? On the company's own website? Well, all the companies, and any, any of your viewers can do this, you can type in official prescribing information into Google with the name of the drug. And if you search uh, diligently on the, the drug company website, you can click official prescribing information and find the drug label. And so Madeline's older sister, uh, Vanessa's older sister Madeline went to school the very next day. And in one minute, by doing that, she found uh, the warnings and contraindications for propulsive that said shouldn't be given to anyone throwing up. Did Health Canada know about that? Sure they knew about it, yes. You didn't know about it, obviously. No, was no. it in the labeling that you got when you picked up the drug? No, no. What you get when you go to a pharmacy is you get a, a, a one sheet of paper done by a software company somewhere in the States, which lists the common side effects, which are relatively harmless, headache or diarrhea or whatever. But they don't list, risk, uh, list the most important side effects, which are the most dangerous, however rare they are. Now, their definition of rare is, uh, that's also surprising, by the way. It, they're not as rare as you think they might be. But when you read that one sheet that the pharmacist gave you, there was nothing on there that would have indicated. No, absolutely nothing. And this is very common in the pharmaceutical industry. The patients don't get the information, and the doctors don't get information in a clear form that they can understand the true risks to explain it to the patients. Four months after your daughter died, Johnson & Johnson took this drug off the market in the United States. How did the Canadian authorities react when that took place? Well, actually, uh, we got notice three days after Vanessa died that it was coming off the market in the United States four months later. For some reason, they delay, and that's another issue altogether. Why they delay, I don't know. And then within uh, about, well, I guess it was July, they took Propulsive off the market in Canada as well. And this is what Health Canada always does. They always wait for the FDA to act, and they, they come along up behind. But did you wonder why they delayed here, given that it was going off there? I still don't know why they delayed here. They say that some patients you know, might have needed the drug. But the thing is, it was not a life-saving drug. I mean, this was a drug that was, had the potential to kill patients, however rarely, and yet they were taking it for non-life-threatening conditions. Didn't make sense mm -hmm. to be and still doesn't. But this is normal in the pharmaceutical industry. How do drug companies inform family doctors about the potential adverse reactions to drugs that are being taken? They generally don't do it very well at all, and they don't really want to do it very well. In fact, most doctors get their drug information from commission detail reps. That's what they're called. They're supposed to go to the doctor's offices and give the details of the drugs. Well, studies have shown they give all the good information about their new drug, how wonderful it is. And when it comes to the safety information, they really play that down. So the doctors don't know if the benefit will outweigh the risks for their patients. In fact, they play up the benefits, they play down the risks, and the doctors think they're great new drugs. And of course, they have great relationships with the drug reps. They, uh, they go to lunch, they go to dinner, sometimes they go to Bahamas. And so the doctors have very clouded thinking and have debts of gratitude to the drug reps. And you think that affects their judgment when it comes to prescribing? It's proven to affect their judgment. In fact, if the vice president of a drug company took 100 doctors down to Bahamas, that's called continuing medical education, by the way, and they have a slideshow in the morning with uh, showing the benefits of their drug, and then they all go out to the beach for two days, and he goes back to the president and says, oh, I spent 250000 taking 100 doc doctors to Bahamas. Well, he, the doc, you know, he's not doing that out of kindness, and the president's not going to be upset with him. He's going to say, way to go, because he knows that those are what they call thought leaders. Those are the doctors that decide what drugs get on the formularies in the hospitals, and the sales are going to start to go like this. Hmm. So we know that these kinds of relationships affect doctors prescribing. The problem is, and studies have shown, that doctors don't realize it affects their prescribing habits. They're not bad people. They don't realize it. They say, how dare you suggest that I would change what I prescribe because I had a free lunch? And it's proven that it does. You used to be, you're a member of parliament now, the federal house, but you used to be an Ontario yes. MPP. Did you take contributions from big pharmaceutical yes, companies? Did. You yes, did. Yes, I did, to my shame. But I, I have to say, I didn't know at that time, Steve. I didn't know how the pharmaceutical industry works. And how the pharmaceutical industry really works, it's outlined in my book, Death by Prescription. I think most people who read it will be a little bit shocked as well. But I thought they were producing drugs they were, that were always helpful and that they were always in the safest conditions. And sure, I took their contributions. I went to the, the fancy dinners and I went to the golf tournaments. And uh, that's normal between politicians and the pharmaceutical industry provincially. I should mention now, all those uh, donations from pharmaceutical companies, by the way, federally, from any company now are all banned. They're all banned. So there are no MPs who are getting money from pharmaceutical companies it's now? It's against the law now. You can't take a federal MP, cannot take money from any company or any business From a company, anymore. but obviously from the employees of the company or the they executives could. or whatever. They could. That happens. And do you anymore? I would never. Not anymore. Did you feel indebted to them when you took their money? 
You do. You feel like they're your friends. And this is what happens to people in public life. You have people around you, all of a sudden your jokes are funnier and they're inviting you out to dinner and they're inviting you to lunch and golf tournaments and you start to think these people are your friends and you trust them. And so when they give you all the good stuff about their products and how it keeps people out of hospital and saves the system money, you start to believe. You think, well, this is a, this is a good person. This is a trustworthy person. But you know, half truth is a whole lie. And they don't tell you the other side, all the people who are ending up in hospital from adverse reactions to the drugs. If, after your investigation of all of this and the book that has come from it, you have concluded that too many doctors are too indebted to the pharmaceutical companies and too many politicians are, and Health Canada is, who actually is out there looking after and advocating on behalf of patients? Um, I work on the internet with a group of people. We have a listserv. We talk on almost daily basis. And that's the only group of people I found who are totally dedicated to patients. Uh, there's a group out of Washington called Public Citizen, and they have a website called Worst Pills, Best Pills. There are pharmacists and doctors, and I communicate with this group. Some of them are in other countries as well. But for purely looking after the interest of patients, that's all I found. The pharmaceutical companies have so much money, they're the most profitable companies in the world. They spread it around in our universities, um, in, well, in the media as well. They, they have huge advantage if you ever end up in court with them because they have huge, you know, they can hire lawyers and keep you tied up in court for years. They use their money and the resources to make sure people hear all the good things about their drugs and they really play down any of the risks. Let's sort of come full circle here and, and finish off on what eventually happened in your case. The Ontario coroner decided to look into Vanessa's death. Yes. What did the jury conclude in that? Uh, the jury concluded that Vanessa had uh, died um, in relation to propulsive. The propulsive caused her death in conjunction with bulimia. Um, and there was an added part, they said, in one possible cofactor. And that was how the, this is what the pharmaceutical companies do. They're always able to plant seeds of doubt in court and in the media elsewhere that it wasn't really their drug that caused the death. It was the patient's fault. And so they tried to blame Vanessa for her own death. And so they had a, a, a scientist come in. He said that anyone could drop dead at any time. So the jury were supposed to buy that, you know, as, as the cause of a death that Vanessa had some un previously undiagnosed rare condition there had been no evidence for over a drug that was officially responsible for they put that deaths. seed in the jury's mind they always managed to plant seeds of doubt and and uh, also the level of uh, a proof for a drug causing a death is higher than any court in the world you know a civil court is on the balance of probabilities and then there's a higher level for a criminal court which is beyond a reasonable doubt but to prove a drug killed a person has to be cause and effect now by cause and effect cigarettes do not cause lung cancer <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hear you. You also launched a lawsuit, right? You yes. sued the drug company, yeah. Health Canada. What yeah. happened with that suit? Well, um, the opposition, so without uh, getting myself into too much trouble on television, but the opposition brought in motions, and this is typically what they do. It's called deny, delay, divide, and discredit. So they deny everything. And one of the reasons they deny is just normal court, that's what you do. But another reason is because they buy insurance against one of their drugs crashing. And if they have these massive lawsuits, the insurance companies pay the costs. So they don't even lose that much money if they harm all these patients. Well, then they delay. And so with, with the Young family, they delayed us uh, for five, six years in court. Uh, with motions, technical legal motions, and every time you have one, you got to court and argue it, and the judge writes a decision, that takes another eight months. And I think during that period, they're basically hoping that we'll get exhausted emotionally and give up. I think they were hoping I would die over the years. Of course, I didn't. I'm still here and alive. <laughs> and so eventually, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Johnson settled with 13,000 litigants for propulsive in the United States, and then they came up to Canada, and they talked to me about settlement. And so for various reasons, that was the wise thing to do uh, on our part. Well, uh, you, presumably, you don't want to lose your house. You know, the legal well, bills start to mount. Well, what happens is under there's a civil procedure rule in Ontario that if you get an offer of settlement to settle outside court from a major company for damages, and you don't accept it, you can get your day in court. But if you don't get awarded by a judge or jury the same amount you were offered in settlement, you'll probably have to pay their legal bills. In our case, that would have been, we'd have to pay them a million dollars. I would have lost everything on top of losing Vanessa. So I had little choice but to settle. But what I'm allowed to say is that the, the case was settled to the, uh, the agreement of both parties. I want to do one more thing here before we go over and join the rest of the gang on the other side of the studio. And uh, read a, uh, I want to read an excerpt from your book and then ask you one more thing. When it was all said and done, you write, I think the ultimate enemy was self-interest. Professional people in positions of trust neglected to do what they knew they should have. Others concerned about their jobs and careers turned a blind eye to dangers which they never would have exposed their own families to. 
They turned off their sense of right and wrong when they went to work each day. But the people who casually manipulated the self-interest of others and acted to delay and undermine effective warnings that would have saved Vanessa's life deserve special recognition. You are one member of parliament out of whatever it is, 308. 308. Um, you're trying to make some progress against the way politics is done, against the way the pharmaceutical companies act, against the way doctors uh, either too cavalierly or too casually prescribe these things. They all have a stake in the status quo. What possible chance do you have against all of that? Um, I've asked myself, Steve, that many, many times. And I think, I don't know, I think I'm just on the side of right, so I just keep going. I just, I have this resolve. I know that it's the right thing to do, but I have friends. I have friends I've met along the way, those people on listserv that supported me and have educated me on prescription drugs for five years. And I run into, I make one or more, two friends every day who say, you're doing the right thing, keep going. And I'm just hoping at some point it'll reach a critical math, a mass, or the right person will say, uh, this guy's right, we gotta act on this. We need an independent drug agency in Canada to deal with these issues. And so I'm just resolved to keep doing it. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna keep working until, it's, until I succeed. Well, let's continue on the other side of the studio. Terrence Thank you. Young, thanks, thanks for coming in, and let's go continue our conversation Great. over Thank here. You.